All right, good to see everybody here this evening, and uh, glad you made it out to the midweek service. We're going to be in chapter 6 and 7 this evening. Esther 6 and 7. If you remember, we uh, ended last week with uh, the king being unable to sleep. And uh, being unable to sleep, he asked for guys to come in and, you know, read the congressional record to him. And uh, they just happened to open to where the, it was uncovered that two men were going to assassinate the, the king. And Mordecai was the one who revealed it. And uh, the men were arrested and executed. But he found out nothing was ever done for this man. Nothing was ever done for Mordecai. And so, verse number 4, picking up there in Esther 6, the king said, who is in the court? So now it's morning, and he hears somebody in the court, and he says, now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. He got home that night and was so upset about Mordecai. I remember, and his wife and his friends said, here's what you do, you build that gallows. Now remember, the gallows was 75 feet tall, and it's not, it's not something you put your arms through and your head through. It's, it's a spear, 75 feet tall, that they would impale somebody on. Okay, and up there for everybody to see. And uh, that's what they, he intended to do with Mordecai. And so uh, he comes in, he's, he's ready to talk to the king about killing Mordecai, hang him on those gallows. Now, the king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Well, let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? What a great guy, huh? 
Huh? Ah, there's nobody better honor than me. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Boy, I would like to have seen his face. Wouldn't you? Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. But Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains, and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight and as we continue on this amazing story of the book of Esther and your deliverance of your people, Lord, I pray you'll open our understanding tonight and help us to glean the truths you'd have for us this evening. Lord, allow us to uh, behold wondrous things out of your word tonight. Speak to us and help us in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Esther's invited the king and Haman to the feast, and it's the second feast, remember? Uh, she made the first feast, and then invited him the second day, still didn't spill the beans, so to speak, about what was going on or what her petition or request was. And the, the king can't sleep. I came across this. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, some of you are familiar with him, he wrote this. He said, This night that the king could not sleep was the most eventful night in the history of the empire because it's the turning point in the book of Esther. Have you noticed how God uses little things to carry out His program? Years before in Egypt, God brought together a woman's heart and a baby's cry when Pharaoh's daughter found the baby Moses in the Nile River. And by that, He changed the destiny of the nation. On this particular night, the servants just happened to turn to a certain place in the minutes. Did I say just happened to turn? Little things are beginning to pile up and reveal God's hand in the glove of human circumstances. God is moving. He is overruling. There is no accident that Esther has become queen. No accident that she presented herself to the king and found favor in his sight. No accident that he accepts her invitation to a banquet. And no accident that he's unable to sleep. And no accident that the servant begins to read in a certain place. God is at work. Boy, I like that. Now, let's, uh, if you're going to fill your paper out, number one is this. Pride brings destruction. Humility brings honor. Pride brings destruction. Humility brings honor. Haman comes in, as we read, and, and the king, uh, not knowing really anything, that the, uh, he just thinks he's the main guy. I mean, nobody's coming to the banquet but the king and him and Esther, so he's got to be the one who the king delights in. Uh, there's nobody else. And, and so he thinks, uh, the king is saying, I, I, I want to honor somebody, what should I do? And, and boy, he lays it on thick, doesn't he? Uh, the apparel that you wear, the horse that you ride, and uh, somebody will lead him through the city and say, here's the one whom the king delights, and they would treat this guy just like the king. And I can just imagine when <laughs> he says, okay, I want you to do all of what you just said. To Mordecai. I, I think I could hear his jaw hit the floor if I would have been there. But, but it's such an amazing thing it, to see. Could you imagine? I don't think, I don't think knowing Haman, I don't know him, but I, I feel like I know him reading about him, but that, that other people had to know he intended to kill Mordecai. 
I don't think his hatred of Mordecai was a secret. I think everybody knew that, and certainly they might have seen the 75-foot gallows he built. Now think about this. Now the next day they see him leading a horse through the city. Behold the man in whom the king delights. And who's he pointing to? Mordecai. I can imagine, I can imagine people saying, Hey, Haman, I thought you were hanging him. I thought you were going to kill him. What's up with that? I don't think man's changed that much in these years. I think they had their hecklers then as well. And people to rub it in a little bit. And it's, there's a couple things. It's, it, it, Mordecai, there's such a contrast here between Mordecai and his humility and Haman's pride. Haman's pride is going to bring him low and Mordecai, Mordecai's humility is going to, going to exalt him. Haman, who desires praise and exaltation, is going to be humbled. Do for Mordecai the Jew all that you have said. One sentence from the king's mouth and Haman's attitude completely changes. From arrogance and pride to utter humiliation. Now he has to walk through the city crying out, this is the man, this is what's done for the man in whom the king delights. His own swollen pride becomes his entrapment. It's amazing. Do you notice it's careful to say, the king is careful to say, he didn't just say, do this to Mordecai. He said, do it to Mordecai the Jew. Now the king knows Mordecai is a Jew. He's aware of that. That must have been in the record. And so he knows the Jew is not there to hurt him. The Jew is not there to overthrow his kingdom. Why? He had an opportunity to right there. He could let those guys carry out his assassination plot. But he didn't do it. And now Haman knows that the king knows Mordecai is a Jew. So the preeminent enemy of the Jews, Haman, now has to give honor to the Jew that he hates. For a whole day, he's the servant of Mordecai, commanding the people to bow down and honor him. The very thing that Mordecai would not do for Haman Haman has to tell others to do for Mordecai. It's unbelievable. Now, in 18, this, this is interesting. Um, Mordecai riding on the horse, the Bible doesn't say he said anything. I don't think he did. I don't think he was vengeful. I don't think he was taking jabs at Haman though he could have, but the Bible didn't say that. I think he wrote in silence. Uh, Alexander Raleigh wrote this on, when he wrote his book on Esther. He said, A proud, ambitious man would have said to himself, No more of the king's gate for me. Look, look down at uh, verse number 12. After it's all over, and the day's done, Mordecai has been taken through the city, he's been honored. Verse 12, Mordecai came again to where? King's gate. Why? That's where he stayed. He just went back to where he always was. All right, And that's what he's writing about. He said, A proud, ambitious man would have had to say to himself, No more the king's gate for me. I shall direct my steps now to the king's palace and hold myself ready for honor, which surely must now be at hand. Mordecai seems to have said to himself, If these things are designed for me in God's providence, they'll find me. But they must seek me. I'm not seeking them. Those who confer them know my address, Mordecai, at the king's gate, and they can find me. Let the crowd disperse. I've had enough of their incense. Let Haman go where he will. He's in the hands of the Lord. Let my friends at home wait. They'll hear it all in time. And I can wait at the old place and in the accustomed way at the king's gate. That's Mordecai. That shows a lot about his character. Don't let promotion go to your head. Don't, don't get puffed up. 
Don't be swayed by the applause of men. Wait for God's timing and give Him the glory. Don't seek it for yourself. He'll exalt you in due time. A couple of scriptures. Hold, hold a paper or a finger there in Esther. I want you to look in the New Testament. Look at John 12, 26, and then pick up 1 Corinthians chapter 4. John 12, and then 1 Corinthians 4. First, John 12, notice verse 26. Jesus said, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. See, uh, what, what are you concerned about? The honor or the service? I said, all you should be concerned about is serving. If you just serve, God will see to it you get honored. Now, the other passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And this reference is regarding the judgment seat of Christ where Christians, the Bible says every one of us will give account of ourselves before God. And, and you read about it in 1 Corinthians 3, you read about it in Romans chapter 14, and here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse number 5, Therefore, Paul says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Now here's what the judgment will do. He will both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. God says in that day, He's going to reveal not only what we did, but we'll be able to, He will reveal why we did it. We, we like to think that. We like to think we know why people do what they do. But we don't know. Okay? You, don't, you can't ever tell what's in somebody else's heart. Sometimes you can't tell what's in your own heart. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The only thing you know your heart is God. And so uh, he's saying you'd, you don't know that. But those counsels of our heart will be revealed. Whether we, did we do it to get recognized? Did we do it so people will think we're something? Did we do it so someone can pat us on the back? Did we do it so we'd be noticed? Do we, do, do we find a little bit of Haman in us. Wanting the recognition. Wanting the applause. Wanting people to look up to us. And, and that's a, you know, this, is a, this can be a very frightening verse. Can it not? The counsels of our hearts are going to be made manifest. It means laid open. Everybody will see it. Everybody will know. But the, you, know the, you know the sweet thing about God? The verse didn't stop there. Did you, see, did you read the last line of that verse? Do you notice what it says? And then shall every man have praise of God. Well, that's not what I was expecting to see there. <laughs> then shall every man get, get, you know, I feel like then shall every man be, you know, fall on their face and cry out for mercy. But you know what? God says, I'll find something. Even as I reveal the counsels and thoughts of their heart, you know what? I'm going to find something to praise you for. And by the way, if God can look at me or look at you and find something to praise, couldn't we do that for each other? Hmm? Couldn't we find something to praise about somebody else? And so God will give us the honor when the time comes. But now isn't the honor time. You see, Haman is seeking the demise of his enemy, Mordecai. He's been able to persuade the king to annihilate or at least to set out the proclamation that all the Jews are going to be annihilated. It's a ways off yet. It's about 11 months away. But his agenda brings him to the king just exactly when the king wants to honor Mordecai. And Mordecai gets the honor and Haman gets the humiliation. Haman goes home. Go back to Esther chapter 6. He goes home. Now, do you remember? Do you remember when he went home 24 hours earlier? Huh? After the, the, the first banquet? Look back. Look back in chapter 5. Haman had refrained himself when Mordecai wouldn't bow in verse 10. When he came home, do you see that? He sent and called for his friends and Zeresh's wife, and Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children, 
And all the things wherein the king had promoted him. And now he advanced him above all the princes and servants of the king. And moreover, yea, Esther, the queen, did let no man come in with the king under the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I'm invited unto her also with the king. Huh? Oh man, he's just laying it on how great I am. Well, he goes home 24 hours later. But it's a whole different guy now. Haman, he, he went hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. Verse 13. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. <laughs> he then, this happened, and then I had to do this, then I had to do this, and now he's crying and sniveling, and, and, and poor me, and I'm, I'm the victim, and look what's happened. And uh, uh, he's blaming everybody but Haman. It's everybody else's fault. You ever know anybody like that? You ever been like that? Blame everybody else for your problems? For your difficulties? It's never, well, God has taught me a lesson. Or, well, I've really been humbled through this. Or, through this loss, I've, I've, I've gained something. Or, uh, God has taught me that I have to rely on Him. No, it's always, well, if it hadn't been for Him, or if, it, if, if she hadn't said, or if, or if that person wouldn't have done this, you see, it's always somebody else. He, happened, he rehearses everything that happened to him that day. But not a word about him. Not a word that it could have been something he brought on himself. Zeresh's wife said unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, Thou shalt not prevail against him, but thou shalt surely fall before him. She's basically saying, if it's if this is Mordecai the Jew, you're, you're not just going to be humiliated, you're going to die. That's, that's, that's the slave ball version of what she told him. He said, you're done. You're not going to make it. But they don't get to finish, the, and by the way, let's, let's pause there, they don't get to finish the conversation, the Chamberlains come and they're ready to call him to the banquet. So he didn't even get to wallow in his pity very long. He's now got to go to the banquet. But there's something very important she said there. She said, if, if you, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, then you won't prevail against him. Thou shalt, he said, you shall surely fall before him. Two scriptures I want you to look at. One is Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. The other one is Zechariah chapter 2. Genesis 12 and then pick up Zechariah. If you get Malachi, that's the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah is right in front of Malachi. All right, And we'll look at chapter 2. First Genesis 12, this is God's promise to Abram. He tells Abram in verse 1, to get out from thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now here it is, you ready? And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's to the Jew. That's to the people of Israel. That's why, that's why we bless the nation of Israel. That's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible says in Psalm 122, I think, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. See, it's tied together with that. Now look at Zechariah 2. Verse number 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory... Hath he sent me into the nations, under the nations, which spoiled you? For he that toucheth you touches, toucheth the apple of his eye. You touch Israel, you're touching the apple of God's eye. You better not. You better watch it. Uh, the, the, listen, 
I believe God has blessed the United States of America because the United States of America has blessed Israel. And as long as we're friends with her, we can be friends with God. And uh, that you don't touch it. She knew, listen, uh, his wife, Haman's wife, she knew that. She goes, you go against God's people. You go against the seed of the Jews. You don't have a chance. God will take care of them. You didn't, and, and apparently when this first went down, she must not have known <laughs> that, Haman, uh, that Mordecai was a Jew either. But now that she knows, she is exactly right in what she tells him. Well, she don't, again, that's all he knows. That's all he gets from her. He doesn't, he doesn't get a chance for her. She didn't get a chance to show him Genesis or Zechariah, okay, like you got. He leaves. They take him. He's going to the banquet. And so we find out, chapter 7, that Esther tells the king the plan to destroy the Jews. That's what chapter 7 starts. So the king and Haman come to the banquet, verse 1, and with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, Where is, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed thee, or it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then King Hasir's answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he? And where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Well, here she goes. She says, Let my life, verse 3, did you notice? Let my life be given me at the petition and my people at the request. She, she listened carefully to what the king said. He gave her two options. He gave her two different things, a, a request and a petition. And so she's using both. She's a very wise woman. All right? But God has, hey, God has given her the wisdom because she prayed and fasted before she went into the king. Okay? And God is giving her that wisdom. What is thy petition? What is thy request? And she makes both a petition and a request. We are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to slain and to perish. And uh, she's laying it on best she can, making it strong as she can make it, make it a real impassioned plea. And, and I, could, I, can, I can imagine, listen, as, as stunned as Haman was when the king told him, about all the things that he wanted to honor, and Haman lays it all out, and he says, you go do that for Mordecai the Jew. Now he finds out Esther's a Jew. Oh! He couldn't believe it. I think his draw dropped out again. He had to be, he had to turn a ghostly gray. He thought, what have I done? He knew he was in big trouble. Haman's own wife's words had to ring in his ears. Thou shalt surely fall before him. The final nail is driven in. He finds out the queen is Jewish as well. The, queen, uh, the king was speechless. He didn't know Esther was a Jew either. This was a revelation to him as well. He just thought he was coming to a nice little dinner, a little banquet with the queen, and he finds out his own wife's life's on the line. That a queen, someone wants to kill the queen. He's pretty stunned by the news. And he's upset. He wants to know who and where. Name names right now, Esther. <laughs> And, and she tells him, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. She lays it on pretty heavy with Haman too. Doesn't mince any words. The king is angry, number three. The king's angry. And notice says, verse 7, The king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath 
went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. The king gets up, goes to the garden, basically to cool off. He's, he's acted in haste before, you remember. And he doesn't want to do that again. He wants to cool off before he makes his decision, but, but uh, uh, he, 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 he doesn't want to be hasty in what he does, but he's going to consider what he needs to do, and, but Haman knows what's coming. So he begs, number four, Haman begs the queen for mercy. He falls at the feet of the queen, and in, in the Eastern custom, it would, be, it would be customary for one begging for mercy to pull at the garments of the one with whom they're asking mercy. And so Haman falls upon the bed where Esther was, and while Haman's making a plea for his life, the king comes back in the room. There's Haman laying on the bed, pulling on her clothing. That doesn't look good. And the king knows it. He accuses Haman of trying to attack the queen, and that did it, and the king has decided, and Haman will be punished by death. The king returned, verse 8, out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Before you, before you hung somebody or executed somebody, that's what you did. That was just the, the indication. Haman knew that was coming. And what we find out, number five on your paper, is simply Haman is hanged. This is amazing. Verse 9, Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold, also, the gallows... Fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. And the king said, then the king said, hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Just what a, what a difference 24 hours made in Haman's life. Just 24 hours earlier, there was nobody in the kingdom greater than he. He's boasting to his family, to his friends, how nobody, the king, doesn't like anybody more than me. He's promoted me above everybody. I'm at the private meeting. I'm at the private dinner. Just the king, the queen, and me. Numero uno. There's nobody like me. Now there's 24 hours later, there's no one in the kingdom facing the wrath of the king more than Haman. If you want to exalt yourself, God is able to humble you. God is able to bring you low. Haman made a gallows on which Mordecai was to be hanged and Haman is hanged on those gallows prepared for Mordecai. Now I want us to think just for a few minutes tonight. We're not going to go into chapter 8. When you read about this and you think about these two men, do you, do you find yourself identifying more with Mordecai's humility or Haman's pride? Be honest. Try to be honest with yourself. If you see the pride of Haman creeping in, the good news is if you recognize it and take it to God and ask God to forgive you, He'll forgive you. Pride does not have to rule the heart of a Christian. It ought not to rule the heart of a Christian. You know, things are looking bleak, very bleak for the Jew. I mean, their, their death sentence is sealed. 
It seems like there's nothing they're going to be able to do. After all, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians. It cannot be altered. And yet here at what seemingly would be the 11th hour, God moves to a chain of circumstances to deliver His people. Let me give you a couple lessons. The first one is this. When God seems absent, He's present. You ever felt like God's not around? You ever just felt like what is going on and God doesn't seem to be hearing my prayers and I don't seem to see God in this at all? Maybe, maybe you think you've lost it all, but God will, God will put us in those situations to do two things. Number one, awaken us to the realization that He is still in charge. You know what pride says? I want to be in charge. See, Haman thought he was in charge. He found out he, he wasn't in charge of anything. By the way, the king isn't in charge. But neither is Mordecai or Esther. You're finding out through the whole book of Esther, though God is never mentioned, who's in charge? God is. God, God, God had His way in all of these circumstances. God also does, allows us to think we've lost it all to use as an opportunity to bring us to our knees. That we will fall on our knees before Him and realize we must have Him. Without me, ye can do nothing. Oh, the, the struggle with that is sometimes it looks like we're doing something but it's nothing. We don't get anywhere. All through the time, Haman is strutting around like a proud peacock and plotting evil against the people of God. And, and, and God hadn't ignored him. God hadn't missed any of his statements, the pride of his heart, any of his motives behind his, his decisions. God was invisible, but He was not out of touch. And I'll remind you, when you can't see Him and you think God's not there, oh, He's not out of touch, my friend. He's working. You see, God, God knows our heart. He knows the condition of our soul. God knows, God knows the hidden impurities even in our motives. Paul wrote, you know, I find that even when I do good, evil is present with me. Even the times when I think I'm, I really am doing this for the right reasons, I still find myself fighting off the wrong reasons. But God knows the depravity of our sin. The, the Bible says He remembers that we're dust. He knows that. But God is not impressed with earthly kingdoms and personal towers. God's not impressed with pride and prestige, wealth, or fame. You know what impresses God? A humble heart. A broken and a contrite spirit God will not despise. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Mordecai and Esther learned it and knew it. Haman never grasped it. Well, there's one problem. The decree has been signed and it cannot be reversed. You can't undo it. It's a it's, it's done deal. So what's going to happen? It's the law of the Medes and the Persian. Even the king can't annul it. He can't... He can't do it, so what's going to happen? Well, we'll have to come back next week and find out what happens, all right? That'll be the next chapter as we get together, all right? Let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer, all right? Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this marvelous, marvelous story. And Lord, tonight, we see such the contrast in the 
humility and the seeking of God on behalf of Mordecai and Esther and the self-promotion and the pride of a Haman. And Lord, I pray that You would help us as the New Testament teaches us to be clothed with humility. That we would realize that without You, we are nothing. And therefore, none of us have received anything or that uh, we haven't gotten anything that we have not received from You. So Lord, I pray that each of us would not seek to promote ourselves. Seek the applause of men. Seek the praises of men. But seek only to please you. In all we do. Help us to serve you with the humility of mind. And receive your grace to do so. We love you. Thank you for each one that's come tonight to the service. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.